you know, I was, I was intrigued by uh, the title of today's program, Never Again, Anti-Semitism, Indifference, and Racism. The term of art, never again, has taken on its own cultural and historical meaning, <clears throat> although it's not clear what it means. What is to be never again? Uh, genocide? Uh, Anti-Semitism itself? Uh, again, assumes that there was a failure and that therefore that failure can't be repeated. Uh, but we are all very familiar with uh, Santayana's famous, you know, it's proverb words. Uh, 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 you know, at this point, it's been part of a, a national lexicon. You know, of those people who forget to learn the lessons of history or are doomed to repeat it. And that's a really, it's a great sentence, except that it, it doesn't mean anything because we don't. We all repeat our lesson mistakes we make. I mean, this is what happens when people get married. They always marry the same person again. You know, this is where do, we are doomed to repeat the mistakes we've made before. Uh, in, in, in nowhere in recorded history has that ever worked. It's a great lesson. It's great to keep it in mind, but it's not clear uh, whether we've internalized the message because in fact, mistakes get repeated and history uh, comes back to haunt us and we say, oh my God, we didn't learn that lesson the first time, let's learn it now. And we still learn it momentarily, and that was certainly true. I mean, you know, since Santiana said that, and since all of Holocaust memorialization, which really reached its peak in the early 1990s with the film Schindler's List and the creation of the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., while that was happening, Elie Wiesel, during the, you know, the opening, the inauguration for the museum in Washington, D.C., uh, famously, infamously turned around to President Clinton and said, Mr. President, I just want to say, I was just in, in, in Bosnia, Croatia, Serbia, the former Yugoslavia, and what I saw there reminded me very much of Auschwitz. And you know, President Clinton uh, was very stiff-lipped uh, he didn't expect that, um, but we also know that to his credit, uh, he eventually did intervene in Bosnia late. Uh, everyone was late, we're always late. Um, um, and then he, to his credit, continues to uh, profess that the single biggest mistake uh, in his administration, although he doesn't say it was the Monica Lewinsky scandal, he says the biggest single mistake was the failure to intervene in Rwanda. Uh, for three weeks, uh, nearly a million people were killed. In three weeks, uh, with machetes. Um, and we watched that, and our Secretary of State told us that she wasn't aware of that, and this is nonsense, we're always aware of things. It's never true that governments that can spy on other political leaders somehow miss genocides going on in places in the world. We, if you can spy on Angela Merkel, you can know that a genocide is happening in Rwanda, and we did, we knew that, uh, and we did nothing. So I don't know what Santiana's quote means in the context of that. We've lost six million Congolese. That's another number of six million that we don't think about, six million Jews, six million Congolese. And of course, in Darfur, the numbers are way over a million right now. So what, in what way was the Holocaust Museum an inoculant to that, and hey, I spoken at the Holocaust Museum, it's an incredible place. Uh, I'm not disparaging museums, but I, I do think that there is a smugness when we think about, well, we have, I saw Schindler's List, and when I was in ninth grade, I read Anne Frank, uh, and I, of course I took a school trip in high school to the Holocaust Museum, and therefore, therefore what? What, 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 what is that? What does that mean? It means that you did three things. Uh, that you were required to do in school? Um, does it mean that you would dedicate your life to human rights? Of course not. Does it mean that you would protest on behalf of persecuted people? Probably not. You would be busy doing something else. So there is this, we, a rallying cry, crusading cry of never again, um, but I'm not sure what it means. And you know, if anyone has heard me speak around the country or places around the world, you know, I am, uh, <laughs> I am always the deliverer of bad news. You know, I'm not, I'm not a good you know, toast maker for happy occasions. 
I usually come when things are not great and to remind people that they're not great. So don't be discouraged. What you're getting is what everyone gets. If I show up, this is what you get. There's a dark cloud. If I'm following me, it came in, notice it rained. Uh, <clears throat> um, but, you know, anti-Semitism throughout Europe is at a fever pitch right now. When could we have believed 77 years after, after Kristallnacht that Parisian Jews could be trapped, 200 Parisian Jews trapped in a synagogue with an angry mob chanting outside Hamas, Hamas, Jews to the gas. How is that possible? I mean, how, if, if the lessons of history were learned, if the never again framework has been internalized, how could Europeans allow Jews, Jews trapped in synagogues? We know that Kristallnacht 77 years ago is known for many things, but one of the things that it's known for is that 1,000 synagogues were burned in one night. 1,000 wooden synagogues throughout Germany and, uh, and Austria were burned. And so you would think Jews in synagogues in Europe, those are sacred places. You can't possibly screw, trap them and hunt them down and shout Jews to the gas. Um, we know the murders that took place uh, and immediately after the Charlie Hebdo killings in the Parisian supermarket. We know the murders that took place inside the Belgian Jewish Museum uh, in, in Belgium. Uh, it was in Brussels. Uh, we know about the Danish synagogue uh, that where, the, where they were celebrating a bat mitzvah, where there was a murder outside of that. This is all in the last year, right? This is, this is very, very, very remarkably recent history. I'm just here to somehow remind you that when we talk about never again, what is it that we mean? Because I, don't, I think it's, we should not smugly repeat a phrase that we have no interest in truly acting upon. Um, we know the French rapper uh, Don Dune, I think his name is Don Dune, Don Dune, thank you. My French is bad and I needed you for that, thank you. Uh, but I'm happy to mispronounce his name. He doesn't deserve to. Mbala, Mbala, uh, Dundene, and you know, the, the Quinell, his signature uh, gesture, hand gesture that is essentially an inverted uh, Nazi salute. Um, to Germany's credit, he's been banned in a number of places where he's to appear, but he does have an incredibly loyal and large following throughout France. Um, uh, and then there are, you know, there are, uh, oftentimes more subtle things. Uh, Jim Goldman recently sent me an email that talked about a, 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 a sort of a spa in Germany that called itself, they were uh, doing a special weekend uh, this weekend, and so they're calling it Spa Kristallnacht. Uh, obviously a few people complained and they're not showing, they're not saying it's Spa Kristallnacht anymore, but it was a way to sell tickets for a two-day two spa for the 9th and the 10th. Uh, and so he, the exploitation of the terms of art that we now see. Uh, you know, there was recently, a, Nathan Fiedler has now, and this is, this is supposed to be well-meaning, has these Holocaust awareness windbreakers, uh, which you can buy online. Uh, they're apparently lovely, and they apparently, the proceeds go to Holocaust education, but really a windbreaker, a windbreaker. Uh, what, what if we had a 9-11 windbreaker? What would people say? Uh, you know, I buy the windbreaker and it certainly goes to a good cause, but I trivialize the experience of 9-11 by selling you a windbreaker as if that had anything to do with anything other than uh, blocking out wind. So the Holocaust becomes somewhat of a stand-in for all catastrophes, climate change, you know, uh, Climate change and, aid and, and the Holocaust are really very different. AIDS is very different from the Holocaust. Um, uh, the idea that the Holocaust is constantly invoked now, you know, I'm afraid, you know, in a university, guys like me are afraid to talk, but I do it anyway. Uh, but, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, the, ex the, the, the experience of Palestinians in, 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 in uh, Gaza and West Bank that's not a Holocaust, okay? I know that people like to use that word. Many people don't know, but I'm gonna tell you now and you can repeat it if you go outside. The Palestinian population has doubled since the occupation, doubled. 
Genocides are about subtraction. They're not about doubling. If you're going to double your population, you should not be, you should not be invoking a genocide as an, as an indication of what's happened to you. Something else has happened to you, but I'll tell you what hasn't happened. It's a genocide. The Cambodians, the Rwandans, the Jews, the Armenians would love that genocide. They would love to have doubled in their, in that, instead of having been subtracted. So just, you know, a way, ways in which we tr trivialize. Um, again, the Holocaust had its heyday in the mid-1990s, but I'm not even sure that was a good thing. Uh, movies, many movies, many memoirs. Uh, again, they created a kind of smugness about <clears throat> what it meant to be Holocaust educated, when in fact the whole point of the Holocaust is that it was unknowable, ineffable, unspeakable, unimaginable. If it's all of those things, then it can't be known. It needs to be perceived as what it is, unknowable, mysterious. Um, it may have been a mistake to have domesticated the Holocaust so much throughout the 1990s that it reached a point of being diluted and trivialized such that on an episode of Seinfeld, we had the soup Nazi. And on, on you know, Larry David once did a, a, a spoof on this word survivor and Holocaust tattoos and curb your enthusiasm. Uh, Mayor Giuliani, uh, not Mayor Giuliani, people referred to Mayor Giuliani's police force as Gestapo. The police, NYPD may be many, many things, but it's not the Gestapo. Maybe many things, but it's not that. It's not the same thing. Um, now to the question of in, indifference, uh, which is also part of this discussion. And I'm, I'm going to wrap this up soon. Don't worry. I, I know exactly how long this should go. And I know I got your attention, so I don't want to lose it. Uh, it's building. <laughs> um, well, indifference is a feature, uh, and in many ways a, uh, a, uh, a feature of and a tremendous defect in humanity. It's who we are. We're built to be indifferent. You know, Theodore Adorno, the great 20th century German philosopher, explained it like human relationships are about a numbers of different concentric circles with you in the middle and perhaps your fan second one and maybe your best friends in the third one and then people who are in your tribe or religion in the fourth one. And he basically said that the further out you go, the easier it is to divest people of their humanity. It's easier to frankly just not give a shit, right? Which is why nobody did. You know, people, the Cambodian genocide didn't seem to matter to anyone in the West, and the Armenian genocide didn't seem to matter to most people, and the Congolese, I know, I know right now, even though you're here in this room, most of you did not know that the Congolese suffered six million deaths. I'm sure you didn't know, and you're here. If you're here and didn't know that. Um, so these things are just buzzwords, but they, they don't really mean anything. And by the way, to be fair, when it comes to trivialization, I would say the same thing about Hotel Rwanda. Um, Rwandans from, who lived through that experience know that that film does in any way uh, represent uh, the, what that three weeks was like, the harrowing three weeks, and The Killing Fields, the film about Cam Cambodian genocide. Similarly, you know, Cambodians are so marginalized that they're happy there is a film that would, that, because for most people wouldn't know anything about the Cambodian genocide. And yet at the same time, they too know that when you make art out of atrocity, you dilute, you trivialize, you, you make it less than it was. Why? Because, well, because if it's unimaginable, then it can't be reimagined by artists. And also because there's a fear of giving people too much of it because they won't sit through it. And they won't be able to go and digest their cheesecake after. And they won't be able to sleep at night. And the question is, who is this about? The cheesecake? Or is it about the memory of the dead? If it's about the memory of the dead, the most authentic portrayals are what are required. If it's about simply giving people a taste, well, a taste is, is trivializing. Um, you know, to change the character of a story in order to make the more story more widely accessible is a, is a moral sin. You wouldn't do that with a rape victim and say, well, you know, she kind of liked it. You know, she was sort of, she enjoyed it. I don't, I don't know, with the, I don't care about the bruises. She kind of liked it. Nobody wants to be told then they suffered less than what they experienced. Nobody. 
Uh, and we've done that. We've done that to survivors in this country. And actually, uh, I'm reminded to in mention my good friend Esther fi Finder. Uh, no, Esther, it's not Finder. It's Esther Whit Whitman, right? Esther Whitman is here. Uh, Esther Whitman is here as a survivor and very much a sur crusading survivor in many ways, very politically engaged for many, many years and certainly not silent. Um, but, you know, indifference is a part of our, you know, this, the natural can, history of our species, and we shouldn't be surprised by it. We don't tend to care about the people that are not like us. Uh, and the further they are like us, we just, you know, are truly indifferent. We also have a legal system that sends us messages that people have no ob legal obligation to rescue. We have a moral duty to rescue. Immanuel Kant, the great enlightenment philosopher of Germany talked about the distinctions between moral duties and, and legal duties. And, you know, people who rescue, who do righteous things, they are built in a certain way and we make movies of them and we give them keys to the city. Uh, they act selflessly, they act instinctively, but you can't legislate it, he would say. You can't require it. Most people can't do what they do. They do that way because they're built that way. Um, so there's a moral duty that you can fail and you could be subject to moral censure because of that failure, but you can't make people better people. And that's really the legal system's position, that if you are standing around and watching, if you haven't been acting, and if you're not the cause of somebody else's harm, you, you can't be legally liable from simply standing around and watching. I, in my own classes for years, I wonder why that's true. Why isn't standing around and watching an act? You know what it's called? It's the act of doing nothing. It's an act. It's just that you haven't moved a muscle, but that's not something you should find virtuous. That's something that you should question. Why didn't you move? And why don't we subject to the same kind of legal scrutiny that we, we scrutinize other failures when people act more affirmatively, more directly? Europe, Europe to its credit, is far more uh, uh, willing to recognize duty of rescue. Not enough, obviously, because there's so much genocide that's taken place on that continent. But in the United States alone, this is a very, you know, very important theme that people don't know, that there's no legal duty to rescue. And if you haven't imprinted that, if you've not had that imbued in the minds and memories of people that they do have these obligations, then they probably won't know to do it, and they certainly won't think it's legally required, because if the legal system doesn't make it an obligation, how important can it possibly be? And so, again, there are reasons why there are these failures, but the indifference piece is not something that also should not surprise us. Um, and then let me just finally speak to the concept of racism, um, because that we, we live with all the time. Our nation has never really confronted our history of slavery in an appropriate way. I'm not sure that Martin Luther King birthday covers it sufficiently, uh, and many people are upset about that. Um, you know, we've not acknowledged our racist past. We don't even acknowledge our racist presence, present. Um, the concept of restitution is a non-starter, uh, something that I've always been interested in, restitution for African Americans. Can't even mention this. Um, uh, and so, yes, there's ongoing legacies of racism in the country, and yet, not unlike the Holocaust, there's the exploitation, the manipulation, the trivialization of the civil rights era. Uh, the, uh, the, the civil rights struggle of the 1960s has nothing in common with the Palestinian struggle today. It's just not the same. It's not. And I can tell you why. It's not the same because Martin Luther King never told anyone of his, of African Americans in the South or anywhere, to go outside with knives and stab little kids in the throat. And please, please know the difference. Don't, don't desecrate the memory of Edgar, Medgar Evers and James Meredith and Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King by equating two different types of liberation struggles. One is murderous and the other was passive nonviolent resistance. One seeks to literally murder all of the neighbors and take over all the land and the other one says, we want basic civil rights that every American has. They're not the same and we've mistaken them and in, in, in ways we've done so that I think is an insult to the, the, those who really did 
uh, uh, bring civil rights to African Americans in this country, even though clearly did not, did not end racism. Um, but other kinds of trivialization, and I, again, it's a university, I'm always very careful here, but you know, the whole concept of microaggressions and, and, uh, and trigger warnings. Let me just say really one final thing about this, that you know, there is what happened at Yale, the idea of a culturally insensitive Hollywood cost, uh, Halloween costumes. Uh, it's just not the worst thing that's ever happened to African Americans. It's just not, and I say that as a Jew. Uh, it's just not. A lot worse things have happened. And we, again, this team seems to me trivializes and desecrates what really did happen to African Americans in this country. Uh, and you know what? I know this is also politically incorrect to say. Michael Brown is not the same thing as Martin Luther King. It's not the same, he's not the same guy. He's not the person that should be the poster boy for racism in this country. It's just not. And to try to recharacterize him, to reinvent him, is an, it's an insult, and it trivializes what actually did happen to African Americans in this country. It's an invocation of racism that's simply misapplied to the facts of that situation. And it trivializes, again, the true magnitude of the horror that African Americans experienced from the Middle Passage until the, until the Civil Rights, passage of the Civil Rights legislation. We should always focus on the magnitude of historical suffering. And we should be very careful about trying to create moral equivalences or comparable historical uh, analogies. They're not. They're just not the same. What they are is manipulative and exploitative. And we, we are, we are been surrounded by that for many, many years now. Uh, Kristallnacht was a, a, a tragic rupture in European civilization. That's what it was. And uh, it was a horrifying, devastating attack on human rights and the value of liberal uh, principles that Europe had em embodied since the Enlightenment. Uh, it's important to remember it for what it was and not for what it wasn't. It's also important to keep in mind that, you know, it's not about taking something that doesn't belong to you, like the Holocaust, like Kristallnacht, right, like the civil rights struggle, and misapplying it and using it for, for some other purpose that, again, ends up trivializing, diluting, and misleading, and misrepresenting what it was. My final words is to say I'm honored to be here. I'm honored that Jane, Jim Goldman invited me. But I am lamenting the fact that I don't know how much longer this will take place in this room. Hopefully, you'll be here next year. But will you be here the year thereafter? I wrote an essay when there was the commemoration of the uh, Auschwitz this past January, the liberation of Auschwitz. I wrote an essay. I forgot actually where it ran. And I said, will Auschwitz last you know, another whatever number of years, 70 years? I think that was the, the date. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know. I don't know whether Auschwitz will be what it was, what well, it, it could be a parking lot. Uh, and I say that not to be facetious or comedic, it just it could be a parking lot. People's memories fade. What was once important becomes unimportant. It's very hard to hold on to historical tragedies because it's too painful. It's better to go to Dairy Queen and PTA meetings than to sit with the suffering of you know, mass murder. It's, it's just very hard to do. It's very hard to ask people to do that. It's very hard to ask children to take it on the, upon themselves to be the source of memory. And so uh, it's something to ponder, something to think about, and in some ways something to be grateful for uh, that such a program today was, was built and that you all found the time to join us. Thank you so much. be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. 
Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.